All right. So this is uh, the second of three videos on the evolution of behavior. And so what we're going to look at this time is natural, uh, uh, two things, art artificial selection and natural selection. So we're going to start with artificial selection. Um, and you can read uh, uh, what's on here and um, uh, you can go later and watch the video in the video links. Uh, but what I want to do is get you to realize that Charles Darwin was uh, really interested in artificial selection. He, um, uh, again, was a gentleman farmer and realized that we reproduce cows to give better milk. Um, we chose traits so uh, chickens would uh, lay, lay more eggs and those kind of things. And he was actually very interested in pigeons. And so what happens is, uh, you know, this is, this is the wild pigeon. This is a, a, what we call a rock dove. Um, and this is your standard. Uh, although pigeon fanciers have figured out that you can breed them for certain characteristics, uh, physical characteristics, and then here you have an all white bird with a really fancy tail. And so this is artificial selection where you choose traits in uh, birds that you want and then you get their offspring and then continue down a road to get a certain look. And we do this with cats, we do this with dogs. Dogs are probably one of the best examples. Um, so, but, but again, this is a behavior class. So those are all physical structures, but, it, but we also can see that with, more, uh, with, with behavior. And he was very interested in what they call tumbler pigeons. And they've got this little genetic flaw in their head. And what happens is as they're flying, um, they will somersault. Um, and uh, so when they saw that behavior, they'd find two that did it. And, and it's really a kind of a strange thing. Um, uh, but again, it's a behavior versus a structure. And so that can be done. And so in homing pigeons are another one. You know, you've, you've heard of homing pigeons where you release them and they fly back to where uh, uh, they were raised. That is a very, uh, again, another behavior. Pigeons are very um, well oriented oriented on, on where they're born, but this was taken to an extreme. So again, this is artificial selection. And one of the um, uh, more recent, and again, the 50s is not all that recent, but uh, uh, dogs have been domesticated for a very long time. Uh, so there was an idea, well, foxes are close, closer, closely related to dogs. They're both in the canid family. So what if uh, we did something very similar to what happened to dogs, uh, with foxes. Now, what you got to understand is they are do somewhat domesticated. They're still kind of wild. Um, and so in the 50s, uh, this geneticist decided what he would do is he went down and got some uh, silver foxes, some on the left. It's a, a version of the uh, red fox. Um, and he went to, uh, they were raising them for coats, um, for, for, to make uh, fur coats out of. And he picked up over a hundred animals and what he bought were animals that had less fear in people. And then he got them back to his lab. And what he would do is he would breed two individuals uh, that he, he said were more tame or less fearful. And he continued that for generations. Uh, and within 10 generations, he got some fairly tame silver foxes. Uh, but what's interesting about what happened, uh, very similar to what happened in dogs, uh, and again, these, these are not dogs, they haven't become dogs, um, but what's interesting is uh, the ones that are tamer and, and not afraid of people, physical uh, characteristics have changed. And so what happened is they started seeing some things in the foxes that uh, you don't see in the wild. And one is the tail. You can see the tail on the left is down. Well, the, the tail started to go up and curve, kind of like you see in dogs, and actually a behavior uh, that you don't see in foxes. They, they would actually wag their tail. Uh, the other one you see is the coloration. Uh, typically, the silver foxes, um, you can see they're kind of a... a, a blackish gray and the red foxes are, are kind of that reddish tone with maybe the white chest. Well, you started getting these weird um, 
for color patterns. Uh, the other thing which you don't typically, you don't see in this fox is another thing that actually started showing up was that the ears would start to flop. Um, what this probably means, and we haven't really talked about it yet, but we will in a, in a couple of weeks, is uh, again, the genetics, the genes, um, the information. And it turns out that whatever that tameness gene or genes are, uh, they're on chromosomes, we all have chromosomes. Um, our understanding is probably these behavioral traits are very closely related to, are, are physically close to um, the, the tail, the color, and the ear section. So when you are choosing for this behavior, you're also getting a series of other traits that you're not typically uh, uh, trying to achieve. It just happens to um, uh, come along for the ride, I guess, is a way to put it. All right. And, and so, um, you know, they've been doing this for years. And just to give you, again, behaviors, we've got sheepdogs. And the idea is if you're a shepherd and you want a sheepdog, you, you breed your best herders. You just do. Um, and then over generations, you know, here we show, um, you know, it's, it's make believe, but they, they show in generations, you know, after five generations, you get good herders or, and a very good herder. But if you've always take your best herders, uh, the idea is that eventually you will get nothing but uh, very good to excellent herders. And so again, it's not just physical traits. Like if I'm breeding, uh, you know, I had a neighbor that uh, bred Wattweilers and she showed a Rottweiler, she didn't breed them, she, she showed them. Um, but one of the things that they, they breed for is the big head, the big shoulders. Um, and again, that's a physical trait. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, along with that though, it also usually brings along bad back uh, hips and hip dysplasia uh, commonly seen in Rottweilers, unfortunately. All right, so let's talk about natural selection. Let's talk about um, what actually is happening. And, I, and I'm gonna give you a couple of examples that are happening in the wild. One is Marlene Zook, and I picked her because uh, she used to be local. She used to uh, work out at UCR. Um, she's now at the University of Minnesota, uh, which was her alma mater with, uh, where she went to school. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, smart lady, she um, actually, Sarah Scott, who, who uh, uh, I uh, teach teaches with me and has taught this class with me before uh, actually worked under her uh, as a graduate student. Um, so uh, very nice lady, very smart lady, uh, but uh, so smart she's doing studies in Hawaii. I mean, if you got to pick a place to do studies, smart lady. Okay, so uh, she was working on Kauai and, and what happens is she's a, she's a cricket person. She likes cricket and she's done cricket songs. Um, on Kauai, they thought the uh, crickets were disappearing because they weren't hearing. So year after year they'd go, they'd hear fewer and fewer crickets. Um, and what it turned out is once they, they really started looking around, they found out there were crickets. They just weren't singing. And here in these pictures below, there's a little structure right here uh, that actually makes that sound. And that sound uh, is what attracts females. And that's why crickets call like that. Well, these males have lost that structure. And so they're silent. And so what Marlene and her group thought was the crickets were disappearing. But when they look closer, no, the, there's the same amount of crickets. They're just not calling. Um, and so what happens is there is a fly out there. There's a parasite. And what that fly will do is lay its eggs on the cricket and then the, um, you know, basically in the cricket, and then they, they burrow in and eat and kill the cricket. And that's what you see, this is um, a fly larvae inside a cricket. And so these males have evolved, basically they, they um, if they don't make sound, uh, they um, won't get parasitized. Uh, the smart thing is though, uh, they need to find females. And if you're not calling, how do you find a female? But what they're doing is they're getting close to the calling males. Uh, so as the males call, the, the, the satellite males will kind of get close to. So when the females come looking for the call, they just happen to be there. And uh, um, they, they then get to breed. Uh, so what you're seeing is a huge change. And um, these crickets are on multiple islands. 
And what they're doing now is um, they're actually seeing it happening on one of the other islands. Um, so the question then is, you know, so we, here we have uh, a fly trying to survive, looking for crickets, a cricket trying not to be parasized. Um, again, it didn't physically say, hey, I'm not making a call. Uh, but the ones that were quieter were leaving more offspring. Um, so now we have a lot of quieter males. Now the question is, what happens when the last male um, disappears? What happens to the fly, our singing male disappears? What happens to the fly? What happens to the males? How do, how, do they find, how do the females find the males if they're not calling? Uh, so this is an interesting um, natural selection in the wild. It, it's, it's changes that are happening. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we're not looking at the future. Uh, you know, I don't think a, a cricket's like, well, what happens if we all stop? That's not a question they ask. Um, it's just survival. It, it, and so uh, it'll be, it'll be uh, interesting to see where this, this uh, project goes. Uh, the second and, and actually last uh, uh, example in the wild is um, on these brown anoles um, by Dr. Losis. Uh, and um, brown anoles are these, these tiny little lizards. And there's a slightly bigger lizard you can see on the bottom uh, called the curly tailed lizard. And they will eat the brown anoles. So in the Bahamas, there's a bunch of little rocky outcrops islands. And so what happened is that they have some islands where both of these lizards um, exist. And then they have some islands where they only have uh, the brown anoles. And so uh, what they did is they were looking at those differences. And um, then they actually took, um, well, let me, let me say this. The brown anoles then on islands that, and these are, islands that are pretty low with lower vegetation. They're not these huge tropical islands with massive trees. Um, and, and so what happens is for the brown anoles to avoid this ground dwelling um, curly tailed lizard, uh, they actually are higher in the ve vegetation. They move up higher, thinner branches. Um, uh, the, the rock uh, lizards, the, the curly tailed lizards um, are a little bit too heavy to get out there. Uh, so this is the way they avoid them. So on islands that uh, had these guys, um, uh, that's where you'd find the brown anoles. They just basically move themselves up to try to get away from the predators. So what they did is they actually, what, what uh, Losis, Dr. Losis's group did was introduce uh, these curly tailed lizards to five islands. Um, and what happened was you over time started to see some changes uh, in, in the uh, um, brown anoles. One is, yeah, they moved up. They, they physically tried to get away from um, these lizards. So you saw them more uh, in higher vegetation. But what you would see over time is the male anoles got longer legs, um, uh, which made them uh, a bit faster. And they were better uh, able to get away from uh, uh, the predator. Uh, and that makes sense. So, you know, everybody's breeding, um, but the ones with shorter legs are getting eaten. And so uh, more of the longer leg ones are leaving offspring and they're like their parents. So they're, they're having longer legs. So in male anoles, what you saw was uh, longer legs for speed and for a little bit of easier movement uh, in the vegetation. Uh, the females, on the other hand, took another evolutionary route and they got larger. Um, and the larger size might be able to lay more eggs, um, uh, but, but uh, they got to the point where it's harder uh, for the uh, curly tailed lizards to go after them because they are so big. So the size would uh, uh, prohibit. So the smaller females were being eaten and the larger females weren't. So again, this is another uh, trait we were seeing. So, so this is natural selection happening in the wild. So it's, it, it occurs on every day. Now, you know, we always use in basic bio the, the idea of bacteria uh, and antibiotics is another uh, very good uh, example of natural selection. Uh, but that's not really talking about behavior or animals, which is this class. So that might be another example that you've heard of. Um, but I wanted to go with two that are uh, more animal-based. And so that will stop the share and we will stop the recording.